think of the one moment in life that either like was my worst moment or my best moment or or my defining moment. But you can never really hang your hat on yesterday's moment. So you got to live with today. You got to live the way you got today. And I think especially now with what's going on with uh, you know the whole world being in a in a revolutionary change. I can't really use yesterday to get through today. I gotta, I gotta show up today and do what I gotta do today. Welcome to Waking Up to Life with Rabbi Josh, a podcast built around conversations with people in our community who have found enlightenment in their lives. While these events may not seem life-changing to you, These conversations have shaped the way my guests see the world. This informal conversation and insights from Jewish tradition may change your life as well. And if not, it's just 18 minutes with me. So, l'chaim. Today we welcome Rabbi Yarden Blumstein, the teen director at the Friendship Circle in West Bloomfield, Michigan, to the show. Yarden, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Rabbi Josh. This is awesome. I'm really glad to be here. Yarden and I, or Rabbi Blumstein and I, have been friends for many years, but it's an uncommon friendship. And uh, the idea that we have been able to bridge the gap between communities is one of the most strikingly positive places that I can find in my career. So Yarden, I'd love for you to share just a little bit about that history and a little bit about your story. What is your enlightenment that you are going to share today. Thanks. Um, first of all, the history of that relationship, I don't even remember how it begun, but uh, I remember getting to town and being like, that's someone I want to try to be like. And uh, the next thing I knew it, I wasn't just trying to be like you, I was actually uh, hanging out with you, which was even cooler. Um, and that was, it's been a great journey, a great experience. And uh, we even got some basketball games in this year, which was a real highlight and a peak in that. Um, my enlightenment moment, this was a really tough question because, you know, there's a concept called the spot, which means that everything leading up to this moment in time defines the way I see life, which means that really like every moment plays into who I am, the way I see the world and what I'm doing, which ultimately leads me to, I think my enlightenment moment is hopefully my next moment or this moment that I have right now, because on the one hand, you know, sometimes I think of the one moment in life that either like was my worst moment or my best moment or, or my defining moment, but you can never really hang your hat on yesterday's moments. You got to live with today. You got to live the way you got today. And I think especially now with what's going on with, uh, you know, the whole world being in a, in a revolutionary change, I can't really use yesterday to get through today. I got to, I got to show up today and do what I got to do today. So it's interesting to hear you talk in those terms. In some ways, it's a very deep and esoteric concept that your enlightened moment hasn't even happened to you yet. But there must be a few things that have occurred in your career, in the course of your relationships with other people that have led you to believe that the best is yet to come. Can you describe one or two of those? Sure. Uh, That's a great point, too. I mean... I think there's definitely a few of them that really define a why the best is yet to come. One is, I mean, I work in teen engagement and we all know that the teen world, um, you know, when people work in that world change over on a regular basis. And, you know, when you start seeing people that have like 10 years in the field, you're like, wow, you know, are you about to burn out? Are you about to shift on? And one of those mindsets that a mentor of mine told me was, if you think you already did the work, then obviously you're burned out and you're ready to move on. But if you think you're about to start doing the work, then you're ready to start doing the work tomorrow and today. So I've always tried to do that. Um, But then you also talk about things that formed who I am. Like for example, right now I'm really passionate about mental health and suicide prevention. And you know, um, JFS locally was doing a training and they needed a couple more people and they asked me if I'd come. And walking in, I thought I was just doing a favor, like, hey, they need to hit a certain amount of people on a grant. I didn't realize that, you know, those three hours or those ended up being two days of training would turn my next four or five years on a mission of trying to make the world or the community more suicide prevention aware. I didn't realize that'd be like one of the moments that defined the hat I wear in the community today. Um, And I think there's other moments like that. I remember once I stepped into the Friendship Circles division of Friendship House, which deals with people in crisis. 
And I actually remember um, you called me and you said, hey, there's someone who needs help. And I was like, great, tell me what to do. And you're like, no, that's, you took on the role. You figure it out and tell me what you did. And I was like, oh, wait, that's me now. Like, it's, I think at certain points in life, you also look back and you're like, oh, wait, I am the adult. When did that happen? And I need to own the space that I claim to own. So I definitely think there's lots of moments like that that really have impacted my growth and development, but hopefully I'm not done. I love what you're saying. In some ways, what you're helping all of us to understand is that simply maturing to the next phase of your existence is actually enlightenment as it happens. And and maybe the question of enlightenment is actually recognizing it in ourselves, that until we recognize it in ourselves, we can't actuate who we want to become. So... uh, you mentioned in passing that you're doing work right now in suicide prevention, specifically the You Matter program in our community. Talk about why that is so important to you personally. We all know why it's important for the, for the sake of humanity, but why for you personally is it important? You know, that's a great question. Um, I was putting my kids to bed one night, maybe it was five, six months ago, it was before the pandemic hit. And I got a phone call and the phone call was, you need to come here now. And I remember my kid telling me like, could you finish the story? Like, what does now mean in this context? And I think all of us know, especially if we're in the line of service that a lot of times we're put in situations where, you know, it's being of service and it's stepping out and doing those callings. And on the drive over, I was like, why? Like, why did I opt into this service? And I think, you know, as a kid, you, oh, I wanna be that person that's so busy. I don't have time for things in my life and I'm ignoring phone calls then you get there, you're like, why did I want this? Like, why was this glorifying? And why did I opt into putting all my values on the side in order to have all the, I mean, yes, ultimately my family gains from who I am. I think we all know that like, this makes us who we are and makes our families appreciate their values and everything they have. But why did it speak to me? And I asked myself that a lot. Like, why, why do I want to be in a position where um, I'm able to help people that are really suffering or really isolated. And I don't know if there's any one moment that really did it. I mean, you know, someone called, they needed something, and I, and I happened to have the resource to help them, and I was able to be of service. And I think that that moment of realizing that I can do something for somebody um, to help them, and that's as simple as it is. You know, we talk about doing something to help somebody, and it's really simple. It doesn't have to be a complex system. It doesn't have to be anything um, overly complex. And I've heard you say it several times too, like, you know, keep it simple. We don't need a complex program to develop a relationship, just develop the relationship. And I think that, uh, ultimately I've kept that to heart. Like I don't need a program in order to help someone out. I don't need a program to define why I'm friends with somebody. If I could be there for somebody, that's great. And you mentioned, uh, that your own children, our own children, specifically those of us in helping professions sometimes suffer the joke that the, the uh, uh, I would say the, the, the shoemaker's children's shoes uh, need repair. Uh, your family, obviously my family, have had to give up a little of us in order to have us serve the community. But do you think that you have been able to share some of those lessons with your own kids, with your own people in your in your intimate circle that have made those relationships look different? I hope so. I think, I mean, I, I think both of us, I would, I would, I think we ask ourselves this on a regular basis. Like, is this having the impact on my family that I wanted to have? And are they gaining and growing? And I hope so. I hope they're realizing that there's, you know, depth to life, there's inherent value to life, that there's complexities in life. Even at a young age, I think, you know, kids pick up on what's important. And I think they start realizing the importance has many values for many different people and that I can hopefully educate and still within, you know, my family that there's real deep value and importance in being of service or being there for someone else and sacrificing for someone else. I would agree with that. And I, I, I'm certain that your family uh, have gained from having you in their life. That's uh, a really important statement for me because personally, I know I have gained from you being in my life. You alluded to it earlier when we talked about the, the origins of our relationship. Some might suggest that it is strange for a reform rabbi and an Orthodox rabbi working in the same community 
to work together, not just as colleagues, but really to see each other as friends, to be unashamed of the opportunity of growth. Why has that, I know why it's mattered to me, but why has that been something that has been an important part of you helping me define that relationship? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Some of these things are you know, things I also think about on a regular basis, but um, I think I think one of the things that's like we all, I shouldn't say we all, but I think we represent a lot of times this idea that there's equality and there's inherent value and don't judge a book by its cover or some of these other ideas that there's, and then, you know, it's amazing to be able to say, I don't just preach this, we practice this. This is something where like, you know, why do we have to look at the things that are different? We can look at the things that are the same and there's so much equality here and there's so much agreement here. Why do we have to let, you know, details deter or derail from where we're trying to go to? And it's interesting because people from other communities, I probably to both of us, and I think to other people as well, have asked, you know, what makes this different? And it's because we're doing it. We're connecting. We're really here to, to be solution-based. We're really here to work together to bring solution. I mean, ultimately, and then also it's led to so many levels of friendship and, and just connectivity that other people are just jealous of. And it's like, you don't have to be jealous. Just go knock on your neighbor's door and get to know them because that's what we did. It's really simple. And if you think about it, these two subject matters, the way we've worked ourselves through this friendship and the work that you are doing in your everyday work at the friendship circle is the same relational decision. You have made a decision as a rabbi to make those relationships matter and in doing so lead to sort of that next step in your life, right? The next, that next moment, as you just you described, the spot. So I, I, it's an impossible question to ask, but I have to ask it. What is next for Rabbi Yarden Blumstein? That's a great question, especially in a time like this where we're all like, what is next? You know, um, what are we looking at next? Um, and I'm gonna quote a couple of things here, but they're really simple things. You know, you once told me, keep it simple. And it's something you hear elsewhere and everywhere else, but especially when we're working, you know, of being of service or being of teens or, 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 or being there for a community, you know, we can overcomplexify things and get caught in everything that doesn't have to happen, or we can simply just try to help someone out and, and do something today that's meaningful. And I think one thing that this pandemic has taught me is I don't need to worry about in six months, a year, five years, where am I going to be in 10 years from now? What am I going to do today? And how do I make a list today that matters today? So I've been trying to do that every day. Like, what do I get up? What can I do of service today? How do I fulfill my job today? Which also leads me to having a mission statement. Um, I have to know what I'm trying to do. I can never know if I did it if I don't know what I'm trying to do. And um, Friendship Circle went on a little journey. Probably, I mean, they do it every so often, but a year and a half ago, like, what is our mission? And it's community, friendship, and support to people in isolation. So that's simple. The whole world's pretty isolated right now. And can I help? How do you build community over Zoom? Or how do you offer some friendship? Or is there something I could do that's supporting to somebody today to help say that I did what I'm trying to do today? And sometimes, you know, during the pandemic, sometimes I got to do that to myself. Sometimes I got to do it to my family a little bit more than I might usually do it. And then my neighbors, my community, is there something I can do to help bug somebody in? And, um, I think that that's where I'm going to be doing tomorrow. It just might look differently. Tomorrow it might look one way and three months it might look another way. But I hope that people can always look at me and say, that's what you're doing. There's a great poem. I'm sure you've read this to me before, but I've also heard elsewhere. What is your dash? And it's, it's a poem about like when someone passes away, they say they're, it's the year they're born, the year they die. But then there's this one dash that sums up everything there were in between. And, you know, the opening question or the question is, is, if you had to put all my life in a dash, would it say that mission or would it say that purpose? Because then, however I'm going to do it, no one's going to sum up. It's just going to simply be, yeah, he helped people out. But that's a great way to go down. So not that that's the way I want to look. That seems a bit negative, you know. No, I, but, but what you said is that the organization with whom you work has chosen to have a mission. And you, by being a part of that organization, have taken that mission and put it on your own soul and your heart. Therefore, it's become who you are. And, but I think that we could all also look at our individual moments and say, what is my personal mission in life? I, I, I want to pursue that further because I think that that's something I haven't done recently, but would help me 
guide the next few days, months, years of my life. I love the idea of creating a personal mission. So we will do this course together, creating a personal mission for teens in our community. So like as we uh, come towards the end of the podcast, uh, I've been asking all of my guests one final question, having nothing to do with the subject matter, but maybe it will for you. Uh, is there a book that you have recently read uh, a section of Jewish literature or a movie or a television show that has been making a difference in your life right now that you would like to share with all of us? Solid question. Um, the most recent book I read that really sent me for a spin is called Range by David Epstein. And he challenges the idea between are you supposed to spend your entire life becoming an expert at something or are you just supposed to explore and then expertise will come to you? And he uses the example of Federoff versus Tiger Woods to get started. Tiger Woods has spent his entire career building something. Um, he won his first golf tournament at the age of two. I don't want to destroy the book. And then he says, you know, there's someone else who became the tennis world expert and he only started getting involved at 17 or 18. So. He challenges a lot of our educational system today with very straightforward examples. And, you know, being somebody who works with teens in an unstructured way, it makes me question a lot of the structures we have in place. And he really, really brought home some strong points that was really eye-opening and refreshing. I love that. It's called Range by David Epstein, you said? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that recommendation. That will be on my bedside later this week, as soon as Amazon can ship it to me. <laughs> it has been a real pleasure to have you as a part of this show. It's also, I must say, a, an incredible pleasure to know you, to have you in my life. I feel great gratitude for our friendship. Feeling is mutual. It's been a pleasure to have Rabbi Jan Blumstein, one of the rabbis, the director of teen programming at the Friendship Circle in West Bloomfield, Michigan. You can find more out about his program and the future episodes of this program, Waking Up to Life with Rabbi Josh, on the Apple Podcast Store and on Spotify. So happy to have you all with me. So looking forward to the next time. Until then, l'chaim. To life.